Welcome to another episode of Mystics in the Chat Room Conversations with Agents of Change. This is Greg Archer. Does what happened before us live on through us? Perhaps. Today's guest, Mark Wo Lin, director of the Family Constellation Institute, the Inherited Trauma Institute, and the Hellinger Institute of Northern California. Mark is North America's leader in inherited family trauma. He is a sought-after lecturer and leads workshops at hospitals, clinics, conferences, and teaching centers around the world. His latest book, It Didn't Start With You, How Inherited Family Trauma Shapes Who We Are and How to End the Cycle, has become a major bestseller. Today, Mark talks about inherited family trauma and so much more and how we can surpass the legacies handed down from our families. Please welcome Mark Wolin. Mark, welcome to the show. It's so great to have you on. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm very intrigued with your work. I have been for many years, attended some of your workshops. They've been fascinating. Um, and I look forward to telling people more about that at the end of the program, too, uh, and where to find you online. And uh, so, it, so it didn't start with you. I love the title. Can you talk a little bit about this wonderful book, which is just coming out in paperback. And uh, how did you come up with that title? And then I want to get into the, you know, the whole juicy yumminess of what's in the book. So uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about that. So as children, we're finding out now scientifically, epigenetically, uh, we're not born with a clean slate as we'd like to believe, that instead we're born with the biolog biological residue of of traumas, traumas that have affected our parents, our grandparents, and we're born with this, the, these fears, these feelings that don't always belong to us. Um, you know, mysteries that we walk around with, anxieties that strike suddenly, or um, obsessive thoughts that, that we have whenever we get into a relationship, or we go to have children, or uh, depressions that we can never get to the bottom of. And, you know, we think we're the issue. We think we're the problem. We think, well, I'm, I'm just wired this way. This is, this is how I am, and this is who I am. And it's not true. We're finding now that, um, uh, that we inherit epigenetic, um, uh, 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 the epigenetic effects of these traumas. Right. Right. Uh, that subject very much intrigues me. It's, I, I brought it up in the book that I wrote, Grace Revealed, because I, I researched and delved into my Polish family history. So, and I'd love for you to explain a little bit more about epigenetics for us too, but my own experience of it, I mean, and, and correct me if I'm wrong or guide me into a place that really feels a little more truthful in terms of like that's, you know, divine truth or whatever, but uh, my experience of it was once I started really digging deep, it felt like I, I awakened this ghost gene that somehow came to life and it was like, wow, I'm going to have like this, you know, party in you. And, you know, at, at different moments, it was depression and mood swings and, you know, which I had, you know, throughout my whole life. But this was amplified, you know, and I felt a lot of the times that I was feeling things that were so pronounced that they didn't really have anything to do with me. I was reacting like a Polish refugee, which, you know, my family, my family was Polish, we're, we're Polish refugees. So am, am I right on about that? It feels like a, like a phantom yes. ghost gene or something. It just comes to life it's during fine. time of stress. Yeah. Yeah. So we can, what I've found is there, there are signs or, or, um, uh, milestones, um, that as soon as we reach a certain age or as soon as we hit a certain stage in our life or as soon as we uh, leave home or move or go to get married or go to have kids or um, uh, get just broken up with by the person that we love, um, we tap into something or it, it gets tapped open, you could say. Um, yeah. Then all of a sudden, we find ourselves with an anxiety that we didn't have prior to this milestone or we reach this age. I'll, I'll tell you something I often explain. Um, let, let's use the age 30. Grandma becomes a widow at 30 and never marries again, you know, loyal to her dead husband. She stays alone. And then um, mom uh, and dad, around the same age, 
they start to disconnect from their partner, not connecting that there's a sort of a, a ancestral alarm clock in yes, a way. Yes. It starts ticking or ringing around this age 30, or it doesn't have to be 30, you know, thereabouts, or 10 years in marriage. Grandma was married 10 years, and then after 10 years of marriage, mom and dad start pulling apart. Or mom was eight, and then the same thing happens again when you're eight. So there's these, it, it's hard to say exactly. It doesn't follow a, um, it doesn't follow an exact pattern. Um, however, um, our parents separate when we're eight, and now when our child's about eight, we begin to pull away from our partner or at that age or after that number of years spent in marriage. And we think our partner's the problem. We go, ah, partner just doesn't do it for me anymore. Right. Never, never connecting that we're part of this epigenetic um, avalanche, in a sense, <laughs> or this genetic expression. Yes. You know, so, yeah, I, you asked me to explain a little bit more about epigenetics. I'm happy to do so. So when a trauma happens, um, it changes us. So uh, our parents, grandparents, it literally causes a chemical change in the DNA. And this changes the way our genes function, sometimes for generations. So technically, after this trauma, um, we will have a shutdown or an internal movement. And maybe it blocks um, a methyl group from attaching to the DNA or adds a methyl group, which blocks the protein. I'm getting very technical. No, I get it. I'm right there with you. I understand. <laughs> the protein um, is either blocked or opened. Um, what happens is the DNA is or the gene is locked into an off position or an on position. And this allows us to have an, a, uh, an adaptation or an advantage from the trauma. For example, this trauma happened, and then there's this adaptive epigenetic response in the DNA, which now sends the genes in this direction, changing how we act and feel to better negotiate that trauma. For example, we can become um, more sensitive or more reactive to situations that are similar to that original trauma. Now, going back to what I talked about earlier, um, maybe age 30 is attached to that trauma, or leaving home is attached to that trauma, or being alone, breaking up with a partner is attached to that trauma, or having children is, are being attached. So clearly, as a Polish refugee, any idea of moving the home or uh, 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 any, any uh, 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 security that starts to feel threatened on any level would tap in this sort of, oh, my God, things don't feel great. Right. I'll give you an example right from Poland. If our parents are from a war-torn country with people being round up and sent away or the Stalin purges of the 30s or – the Holocaust and, and its effects were, or, or a war-torn country, bombs, bullets. The, our grandparents would develop epigenetically sharper reflexes and quicker reaction times to deal with this trauma. Well, that's a skill set. Now they've, they've now adapted, developed, and they now pass forward the skill set to us born in middle America without bombs going off. And here we are preparing for a catastrophe that <laughs> never arrives. Right. And we've all inherited a, um, not just the skill set to deal with war, but we've now inherited a stress response with the dials set to 10 waiting for this catastrophe that never arrives. And it can be harmful to our psyches, harmful to our bodies. And, and that's what many of us are walking around dealing with. Wow, you know, when you talk about that, I feel like you just described the last three years of my life. <laughs> because really, I thought I'd write this fabulous book and really honor my family, which I felt I did, and it did well, and it's still doing well and all that. Um, but, and there's been a lot of luscious and juicy stuff that hap that's been happening in the last three years. But it, it, it sort of happened right around the time, you know, this big media uh, conglomerate bought out this publication that I was at. And so I suddenly went on this wandering journey and intermittently throughout that whole thing these feelings of well where's home what is home what is home all about am i going to find home am i going to feel settled i was 
Yeah, and that's why it felt uh, as if I was reacting and responding like, as if my grandmother and my grandfather were back in the 1940s. It was fascinating to me and haunting and mysterious and mystical and strange. I, it, it, I yes. find it all curious. It's almost, has, almost as if it has a life of its own, right? Be beautifully put. And here you are consciously making the link, which is the issue for 99% of us. We go through it thinking we're the issue, we're the problem. But during that time, because I was in conversation with you, you were connecting um, all of this to what had happened, um, the people sent to the and all, all the stuff that happened in your family history. Um, so you had the awareness to guide yourself, even with the, the mysteries of the, the pain, the depression, or whatever was connected to it, the mood swings. But you were lucky. You knew what was happening. Many of us don't make this link, which is why I wrote the book. I wrote, I wrote the book, It Didn't Start With You, so people could um, explain these mysteries they struggle with and understand that we're not all, well, hence the title, It, doesn't, it Didn't Start With You. Yes, yes. That it doesn't start with us, that we tap into an event, and that event is similar to an earlier trauma in our family history, even our own birth trauma. And all of a sudden, for instance, um, you know, we might have a break in the bond with our mom, let's say, and, and go along. And then as soon as we get broken up with a partner, then all of a sudden we relive the earlier trauma of the break with our mother. It doesn't have to be just generational. It can be um, in this generation as well. However, um, it's so intriguing when we find ourselves reliving mother or father's trauma, grandmother or grandfather's trauma, great-grandmother's trauma. You know, I often tell people, let's talk about your, your grandmother or your great-grandmother that died in childbirth. What do you think happens to the women who go to get married and consider pregnancy unconsciously in that system? Well, they're, they're thinking, no, nah, I don't want to get too serious. I don't want anything that, that leads to marriage. You know, I don't feel very maternal. And um, so there's a couple different elements. One is if I get married and have a child, I could die. But also in that family, uh, the bonds of mothers and children were broken from that mother who died young. Hmm. In that same system, that same family, the guy could feel, nope. Don't want to get too serious. Don't want to have a relationship because his sexuality could cause someone's death. Wow. Wow. Okay. So that's deep. That's, that's real deep. Wow. Huh. So when we start to recognize this, you know, people will get your book or people have, you know, received your book and, and are working through the, 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 the guideposts that you have in there. Um, how do we, then how do we then cope or transform, heal, move forward once we recognize that this is happening? There are times when I have felt like, okay, I see it, I got it. And then there are times when it's like, okay, I'm 15 steps back <laughs> to where I was even, you know, so it's a little, it's, it's very curious because you're almost, almost opening up a Pandora's box in a way. It's like, oh, okay, now you've noticed, so ta-da, <laughs> you know, you're going to, so I'm curious, do, how do we deal with it? And then is it ever fully transformed? So this is where we have to engage the new science of neuroscience. This is where we have to have an experience, which I teach in my book, how to have an experience potent enough, large enough, salient enough, meaningful enough, that we can then um, sit with this experience feeling like, oh, wow, I'm going to practice this. This feels important. So for example, in my work, I might have a child have a conversation with the parents or even a conversation with the dead parents or the, the, the grandparent with whom he or with whom she is um, entangled with, um, and maybe even build, building back a relationship so we can have a new experience of support, a new experience of comfort, a new experience of maybe compassion where there was none for our parents. All of a sudden we go, wow, when I look at what happened behind my parents, it wasn't personal. Or a new experience of compassion for ourselves 
for what we carry in the family, or a new experience of gratitude. Uh, Oprah always says, have a gratitude practice. <laughs> but why? Because gratitude, compassion, loving kindness, generosity, comfort, support, all these experiences that I'm talking about, allow us to pull traction away from the midbrain, from the mammalian brain, the reptilian brain, from the amygdala, and bring engagement to the prefrontal cortex, to the areas of the brain where, where we need to go to create neuroplastic change. So it isn't just having the new experience. It's then practicing the new feelings and the new sensations of this new experience. For example, I might tell someone, you know what? This entanglement with your grandma, um, and she's passed away. Why don't you light a candle um, and, and have a conversation with her as though she's on the other side of that candle, saying, Grandma, I, I know you want the best for me, and I see that I'm feeling your fears. And, and then feel her blessing you and feel her support. And maybe you um, visualize her behind you uh, six times a day, or when you go to sleep at night, put her picture, or maybe a picture of your mom with whom your relationship's broken, or with your dad. Um, and these experiences, Greg, when we practice them, I think Rick Hansen says you practice something six times a day is with a minimum of 30 seconds. Um, but you practice something where you're practicing having the feelings and sensations of the experience. You're asking yourself, as I imagine this, as I visualize this, as I do this, as I take this action, what am I feeling now? Oh, my chest is opening, huh? Huh, I have this spirally feeling. Oh, I have this feeling of support. What's And what's that like? What's happening now? What's kind of like this feeling of, it's though I, in other words, we let the new experience become also meaningful to us and we let the practice become meaningful to us um we we to borrow from rick hansen the neuroscientist out of um the bay area where i'm from um well i'm actually from pittsburgh and i live in the bay area now but uh, he talks about the, the the new practice the new experience has to have five um different tenets it has to to, um, you know, I love his model, HEAL, H-E-A-L. Have a new experience, enrich the new experience, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, absorb the new experience, and L, link the new experience, which is what you did the whole time. As you were going through it, you have already linked it. Now the key is how to have this new experience. Well, any of those things we talked to, an experience of gratitude an experience of comfort, an experience of support, compassion. And then, like he says, um, in, in five ways to install it or enrich it. One is duration. Rather, in it, rather than it be a 10 seconds, have it be 30 seconds or a minute. Um, rather than it be the feeling, he says, intensity. Crank it up. Dial it up. So it's like, a re, you know, inside. Um, uh, he talks about multimodality. Engage many of them. For example, what happens in my body? What happens with my breathing? Um, give it a color if you want to. Um, feel something viscerally when you're having the experience. Oh, uh, right, right. What else do we talk about? Duration, intensity, multimodality. He mentions, um, um, I love his work. He mentions, uh, uh, have it be salient. And have new eye be meaningful for you. And then have beginner eyes, Zen eyes, uh, beginner mind. So you get curious. You have this sense of novelty. Uh, there's a woman, Lisa Wimberger. I like her work as well from the Neurosculpting Institute. And um, she, she talks about, can you have awe and wonder as you have these experiences and you build this neuroplastic change? We now know. That when we do these experiences, sorry for talking so much. But no, I, I love this. You can, it's like working out. I mean, it's like, it's basically you're talking about working out. A couple more things here. That as we have these new experiences, um, not only do we build neuroplastic change by having the dendrites and some other structure now connected with this new experience, the dendrites with this, and we're building new neural structure, new neural pathways. But we also now, 
or having the release, Greg, of feel-good neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin and GABA, or feel good, the, the release of feel-good hormones like oxytocin or estrogen. <clears throat> or, most importantly, from my work, we're affecting the genes, that the very genes involved in stress regulation, the very genes involved in our stress response, they can now function in a new, improved way. And then that can be passed forward. There's a brand new study that I cite in my new paperback about mice who've been traumatized, where they take these very mice and put them in a, a, a positive environment, and then they begin to express differently. Mm. So it can change. It just takes a new experience. Yes, yes. Yeah, you're working – basically, you're, it sounds like you're working new muscles – up here and through here, right? It's like going to the gym, a different type of gym, like the internal gym. Uh, uh, wow. I love, so, uh, I love that. Yeah, the whole last third of my book is devoted to these exercises, these sentences, these healing sentences, these healing visualizations, these, um, these actual real things you do in real life that have an effect. For example, I uh, broken from their core how to bring hand, breath, and awareness to integrate that fragmented young part of themselves or that part that carries grandma's trauma that's held in the body. I teach people how to integrate those fragmented pieces and become more embodied. Mm. Yeah, in fact, I love this uh, this part that you mentioned. It's on your website, too. When you're triggered, locate where you feel uncomfortable in your body. Bring your breath there. Now, why is the breath important? I know why it's important, but if you can share with others why the breath is so vital. Yeah. It, it, when, when, I, we're, when we're not breathing, we're not sensating, we're not feeling into our body, we're not in our body. Breath, breath brings us alive. You know, in so many tra traditions, the word for breath is also the word for life. Um, mm. There's a 5,000 year old yogic principle of Whenever you bring breath to the sensation, and so what I like to do is I tell people, you know, bring your hand to where you feel that stress response in your body. Bring hand here. Bring breath here. And bring awareness here. So where you're actually saying uh, maybe to that young part of yourself or that fragmented part you carry, um, I've got you. I'm here. I'll hold you with our hand, and I'll hold you also with our breath, and I'll breathe with you until you feel safe, or until you feel held, or until you and I integrate, or until you and I are one. I teach this in my book on page 153, but <laughs> one of the reasons I do this is when people can even just use that as a practice, integrating the fragmented parts of self that split off during trauma. That can be enough to really shift our life. Wow, that's brilliant. Change our brains. You know, we've got to change our brain, change your brain, change your life, right? But we've got to change our brains with an experience and then the practice of that experience. Right. Sim simply put. Right. Um, can, you, can you share a little bit about your journey and how you evolved into this type of work? Because I, I actually, I love your story, and I, I think others would appreciate hearing it, too. Sure. My, my story is also my way in, my doorway, as always, as often. You know, when people come to me with, it was also a trauma. And when people come to me with trauma, I get interested because I know trauma is the doorway in. I also know within trauma, within the contraction, of trauma is the expansion waiting to happen. So I often, like one of the posts I put on Facebook or something, you know, the, um, I don't, I don't remember it, but the the very trauma we were born to heal is also the seed of our expansion. Mm. So um, my way in, my doorway was a trauma. I lost my eyesight in one of my eyes, and there was no cure. 
and I was all freaked out. I was a young man at the time. I was my early 30s, and uh, the doctors said, oh, you've got, uh, we don't know why, but you've got this chronic form of retinopathy, and you know the way it's going, bud. We, you know, we're, we, we think you're going to lose your vision in your other eye, which, uh, what do I do? Well, we don't know. All completely we gone. It was completely gone. No, I saw, like, put a fist in front of your eye and try to see me. You know, it's like I could see around you. I could see the fireplace behind you and maybe the purple curtains, but your face would be a gray, blotted out wow. blot. And so um, I couldn't read road signs. This was my dominant eye. And my other eye wasn't very good anyway because I had something as a kid uh, where I only use one eye. So this was the eye I used. Um, and so basically now here I am. Um, and I can't see, and it's going to affect the other eye too. And so I go on a search for healing, and boy, do I go on a search. I leave Pittsburgh. I leave my relationship. I leave my family. I leave my job. I, I travel. Whenever I read, a, I read a book, and I say, whoever this is, I want to study with this master. And whoever this is, and I go everywhere. So my search led me as far as Indonesia, where I'm studying with wow. these masters. I'm sitting at the feet of gurus. I'm chanting. I'm meditating for days on end. I'm fasting for days on end. Um, one time I meditated for three days and nights on a cushion. I swear, it was, it's a cushion this big for 72 hours. I'm on this cushion, and um, you, couldn't, <laughs> uh, you, you couldn't, and you're blindfolded. You're earplugged. You're only given a small bowl of rice in the morning and some water. And, and for 72 hours, you stay up. You're not allowed to fall asleep on this cushion. And you um, just come to know the madness of the mind, which in my case was worst case scenario thinking that if I could just worry hard enough, I'll somehow immunize myself from all this fear and worry. But of course, we know that doesn't work. Um, but one of the interesting things that happened during this period was I'm waiting in line in an ashram all day to see some guru, and I get to the very front of the line, and he looks right at me, and I should say he looks right through me, and he said, go home and make peace with your parents. Wow. And I said, what? And I thought he had to be wrong, because I thought, you know, I was steps away from enlightenment, total enlightenment, of course. <laughs> uh, but, right. So I well, go to another master and he said the same thing it was hysterical go home and call your parents well i listened i went home and i made peace with my parents but it wasn't very easy because what stood in the way and i didn't know this at the time was the inherited trauma the inherited family trauma that i had inherited from my parents from my grandparents all all my grandparents were orphaned in some way hmm. three of them lost their mothers when they were babies or toddlers wow and lost her dad when she was one so ultimately she loses her mother too because her mother's grieving and this feeling of being broken from a mother's love this is what passed forward in my fam in my family and the anxiety the terror that rippled in my body that actually damaged my eye was this was the real source of my vision loss so after healing my relationship with my parents and 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 understanding about this inherited family trauma i Ultimately, my vision came back, and ultimately, I started teaching these principles to people. And then ultimately, I developed a method for healing the effects of inherited family trauma. I never meant to do this, but it just it was a byproduct of the glory of trauma, meaning the doorway, meaning the expansion that waits in our own misery. Wow, that's brilliant. So yeah, it really opened up a door for, and really, and your, your eyesight healed by itself. I didn't, you know, it's funny, Craig, I didn't, I didn't need it to at this point. Huh. You no, know, people would say, how are you doing? It's, I'm great. And they said, well, how's your eye? I go, oh, uh, oh yeah, it's still doing what it's doing. But the me beneath my eye was great. And then I think that's really the key. If we can make peace with our conditions and our symptoms and our depressions and make peace with it as the opening, as the doorway. Um, what happened for me as I made peace with my eye, well, my vision came back, but I didn't, it was, I didn't expect it to, I didn't even need it to. That's but it, fascinating. But there it came back. And so I thought, Ooh, this stuff, <laughs> this stuff really works. And then I developed, um, this method for, um, healing our relationship with our parents, even when our relationship is t terrible. In fact, I teach in the book how to receive something from our parents even when very little was given. Now that's interesting. 
Yes. Yes. And it really, it seems like it, a lot of it does really all stem or boil down to gratitude, you know, being grateful. Yeah. Yeah, gratitude, or which is a feeling that engages the prefrontal cortex, um, because you know it, where we that, where we feel this gratitude now we're integrating, and that's how new neural pathways can can develop. Gratitude again, comfort, support, because many of us feel un, not comforted, not supported by our parents because of the traumas they experienced. So, you know, what I tell people, you mean behind your parents' cruelty or your parents' criticism or your dad's drinking or the abuse or whatever it is you, you experience, a trauma happened that blocked the flow of his or her love. And, of course, they say, oh, yeah, I guess so, because that it's not personal anymore. Yes. It's just a trauma that blocked the flow of love. Yes, yes. I love also what you say, instead of acting out, act in. Yeah. yeah. Which goes back to, uh, you know, the breath and, and getting in touch and, and, and understanding and feeling what you're feeling and what part of your body. But I love that. Instead of acting out, act in. Um, Mark, what would you say are some misconceptions or or uh, that are out there about this type of um especially epigenetics what what about those critics out there that would say oh really i mean are, are you re are we really going to pin it on the generation before us or two generations before us because there are skeptics out there who who say pretty much give me a break it's not real but um but the science is proving it is real yeah then the science is you know this work is sits on a foundation of academic research from major institutions, major institutions. We're, we're talking Mount Sinai Medical in New York. We're talking Emory Medical in Atlanta. We're talking the, the University of Zurich, the Brain Institute. They're all doing these, McGill in, in um, Canada. We're talking all these incredible studies um, that are coming out both with humans and with mice that are showing a three generation link. Mm. Um, I, I'm happy to talk about any of these studies. Uh, you. Give me the red light or the green light. Now I'll do it. Or we can just talk about cases or tips or whatever you'd like. Yeah, I mean, if you want to talk about, uh, yeah, feel free to talk about one of the, you know, that place in Zurich. I mean, the what is that called again? The, the Brain Institute in Zurich. Now, University. see that intrigues me. I feel like I would like to spend six months there. Yeah. <laughs> and they're doing fascinating work where they're separ separating mice from their from their baby mice, from their mothers for a very short period of time. Um, listen to this. For two, no, three hours a day for the first two weeks of life, that's it. Hmm. And then the effects are dire. In other words, these mice went on to develop symptoms um, that we would call depression in humans. And the symptoms seemed to worsen as the mice aged. And the craziest part is some of the males didn't express the symptoms themselves, but appeared to epigenetically transmit the symptoms to their female offspring. And, wow. and then it gets even more interesting. Um, when they looked at the brains uh, of these mice, they found this genetic material, microRNAs, uh, which are responsible for gene regulation. They found an elevation of this genetic material. They found it in the first generation, second generation, and even the pups in the third generation also expressed this depression. But the third generation brain did not have the high incidence of microRNAs. So they said, ah, maybe the effects of this epigenetic transfer can be three generations, but perhaps not beyond that. Fascinating work at, at the Zurich Brain Institute. Oh my gosh. Gosh. But, and why mice? Because mice and humans share 99% of a similar genetic makeup, meaning 99% of the genes in humans have counterparts in mice. So, you know, at Emory Medical University, <laughs> they took mice and shocked them every time they smelled this sweet smell of cherry blossoms. And then they took the shock mice and examined them, and they found out that they already had an, an epigenetic adaptation. They found out that their brains had enlarged areas where there were more smell receptors.
to detect that smell at lesser concentrations, thus protecting them. Because if they can smell it more quickly, hence they can protect themselves. They also found changes in the blood and the sperm. So they took the sperm of these male mice and they injected into females that weren't shocked. And then they took the progeny in the next two generations. And what they found was amazing. The mice in the following, the pups and the grand pups, had the same stress response, the same jittery, shaky, jumpy feeling when they smelled the cherry blossom scent without ever directly experiencing the trauma. Hmm. Rachel Yehuda, the, neuro, the neuroscientist out of Mount Sinai Medical, she um, found that the Holocaust survivors and their children shared the exact same gene changes in the exact same region of the exact same gene. Technically, the FABP5 gene, for all you people out there who know your genes, uh, or where, <laughs> whatever. But, um, um, and she says that you and I are three times more likely to have post-traumatic stress disorder if one of our parents had PTSD. Wow, and, wow. And as a result, we're likely to struggle with depression or anxiety. Right. And it's about all our fathers that went off to war and came home, or our mothers that lost babies, or our mothers that were had breaks in the bonds with their mothers, or our fathers who were in foster care, etc. I mean, come on. It's endless, right? It is. And, uh, you know, I found that particularly interesting because when I was doing book talks about my book and I, I and I touched upon epigenetics a little bit in some of these talks and the other parts were just so much about this interesting unearthed part of history that not many people knew about what Stalin did to Poles but um, those children of the individuals that went through the war and this whole Stalin experience were sitting there going oh my gosh you're talking about something and they they really resonated with the idea that, yes, there is something indeed called inherited family trauma. And they wanted, they were just so hungry to, to understand more about it. I found that absolutely fascinating. And that was one of the reasons why I wanted to, you know, create a way to really talk about this more and, and, and bring it to light. Cause I, I think it's just so fascinating. The more you shed light on something, I mean, the more you can see and, and figure out, you know, ways to go about moving through it, transforming, understanding, understanding yourself, you know. So, um, well. well let, let, your, let your Polish family members know in Poland that it's in Polish. The book has been translated. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's really good. You know, funny, the Eastern Europeans have really picked up on the book. It's in Romanian and Czech, uh, Czech Republic and Turkey and Poland and German and a lot of countries that have great trauma have trans Hungary have translated this book. Wow. China, Japan, Spain, you know, uh, Korea. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I have a few more questions for you. I, I always like to kind of finish up on, um, kind of a fun note here, but I, I love your excitement about this, but I'm curious to find out what excites you most about the work that you do in the world today. Well, I, I see change. That's, that's what's exciting. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm an unwanted to be therapist. You know, I never expected. And, and really I, I, I see myself as an educator. So what I do is I bring this idea out into the world and, um, because people don't know they're connected with it. So I love to see the lights go on. Um, somebody says, oh, yeah, um, uh, I, 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 oh, gosh, I could tell you so many cases. But a lot of people have this thing, I'll do something terrible and I'll deserve to die. Mm, whoa. And, you know, and they live with this feeling. And when you look in the family history, um, you know that, the, you know, you know that's not their sentence. And you look back and you see what grandpa did and um, sort of escaped justice because he was a war criminal or he took a life. I worked with this one woman whose grandmother was an alcoholic and was driving uh, grandpa and she crashed in a drunken stupor into a pole and grandpa died, but grandma lived. And she would have felt she deserved to die. But here was this feeling um, two generations later in a cutter who felt every time that she cut herself, um, she felt that she deserved to die. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't the feeling. So me, I love to see the lights go on. 
I love to see people unhook, disengage. It's sort of like a Rilke poem that I love very much. About yes, I love this poem. Feel free to to, to read it because you read you, it. Yes, please. This is amazing. Uh, this is, everyone, this is an amazing poem. <laughs> Uh oh! Let me find it. Let me find it. Um, of course, Rilke. You can't not you cannot go wrong with Rilke. That's true. Oh, oh goodness! All right, it's on. Let me let me find it. Uh, um, it's it's really it's refreshing to, and this is why I love connecting with with individuals whom I, you know. And the show is called Mystics in a Chat Room because I think, in some level, we are all mystics, and the conversations that we can have with one another create such an opportunity for everyone to gather new information, to grow, to find out something about themselves and, and share something with others. And and uh, that's why I love doing this and being committed to sharing uh, these conversations with agents of change, which I've been so lucky to meet so many amazing people. I feel really uh, fortunate that that's uh, unraveled in the way that it has in my trajectory. Um, but yes, you're, you're, Wilk, you're the, the poem, the poem. Well, I was just going to say thank you for having me. I always love talking to Greg, and it's such a good conversation to bring this stuff out into the world together, um, because I, our books are aligned in that way. Um, but let let me read my favorite poem. Absolutely, um, I, have, I have it here on the screen. Um, it's a real cup poem, and I've seen other translation, but none is as good as this translation by my friend Kim Rosen, who wrote the book Saved by the po Saved by a Poem. Um, this is her translation of Departure of the Prodigal Son. Now, to walk away from all this entanglement that is ours and yet does not belong to us, that like the water in an old well reflect, re reflects us trembling and distorts the image that hooks us again and again like thorns, to walk away from this and that we long ago stopped seeing, so commonplace were they and so familiar, then to look back once and see at last, tender, forgiving, as if for the first time so fresh, how impersonal is the suffering that comes to all of us, that fills childhood to the brim and then to walk away, rending hand from hand as if to reopen a wound and walk away where? Into the unknown, far into an unfamiliar, warm country that whatever happens remains indifferent as a backdrop, a garden, or a wall. And walk away, why? From zeal, from mission, impatience dark expectation from not knowing and not being known to take on all this to let go all hope to let fall whatever you may still be holding on to perhaps to die alone not knowing why is this the opening to a new life mm. Well, I've got to breathe that in. Yeah, boy. Now that's some powerful. That's some powerful. Um, those are that some is, powerful words. Yeah, that's beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Wow. Wow. Yeah. It kind of. Uh, boy, that's impactful. <laughs> that's impactful. Woo! That's juicy. Um, Mark, what's the most interesting thing you've been learning about yourself lately? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh. God, I hate to toe the party line here, but it's what I teach. You know, the more we practice um, having new experiences and the more we practice being embodied and the more we practice the question, um, what what am I feeling right now? What's going on right now? The more the more we become present, and the more we really live our lives. So we talked beforehand, and I work so much, so I have been working so much that I 
uh, this line from Leonard Cohen, um, the present's not that pleasant, just a lot of things to do. You know, <laughs> where I've been keeping out of the present, which isn't the truth. You know, the present is really where it is. And I, I've been working so much, I, my practice has been falling by the wayside. So what, what I've been learning lately is to be more with my practice, to be more with my body, to be more with um, the feelings of comfort, support, gratitude, loving kindness, um, generosity. Right, yeah. right. Wow. And smiling more and having more joy, really. Yeah. Yes, wow. yes. And, yeah. not work, and not working so much. Right, right. Finding that, you know, I think a lot of people can relate to that because, you know, it's, uh, that finding that ideal balance for our bodies. And I guess it changes um, as we move through different eras of our lives. So, yeah, being very aware of it. Um, hmm, wow, thank you for sharing that. Um, okay, well, one last question for you. Um, what is some of the best advice or bits of wisdom you have been given about life or thriving or living? Yeah. Can you relate it to inherited family trauma? You certainly can. Yes, it's your answer. You can do anything you want with it. <laughs> well, you know, make the link. You know, make the link. Uh, look, look inside at, at the... at. Um, at why we feel the way we do you know a lot, a lot of times what's missing is the puzzle piece and when we have that puzzle piece it's like finding um, the context that explains why we feel the way we do so look inside and make the link and do your inner work talk about these traumas so they're not passed forward um, tell your children if you have children um, because they don't know what they're connected to and um, do your work. Do you, you ask me personally, right? Bit of wisdom, but really it comes down to uh, talk about these traumas, have new experiences, um, grow the good, um, grow the positive things in your life. You know, like Thich Nhat Hanh says, water the weeds or the flowers. Whichever you water will grow. <laughs> so water, water the flowers in your life. Yes, yeah. whatever you water grows. Whatever you water grows. Boy, that is the truth. Mark, thank you so much. MarkWillin.com. It didn't start with you. Look on the bottom of your screen there, folks. You'll see where you can get all of this fabulous information and learn more about Mark. Mark, thank you so much for being a guest on the show today. It's great to see the work that you're doing in the world, and I think a lot of people are definitely benefiting from it. So thank you. Greg, thank you for having me. It's been All fun. right. Uh, be well, and uh, onward we go, and more next time. See you. Thank you.